Hey guys, this is Brendan with Evoke Bike. We've got another strong podcast episode for you today with Cyrus Monk from Australia, who is not only an amazing bike racer, he's a coach and scientist. So we get into a lot from not only his anecdotal evidence from training, but the training that he prescribes to other athletes, as well as what the science says on some of these different types of training. We talk about a lot of different topics, and I'm just going to rattle off some that we highlight through of supplements, heat training, really looking at the intensity of rides, like when he started riding versus endurance rides, athletes trying to understand what it means to train through races so that you're not actually trying to be 100% for every race or that you actually won't be 100% ever. Not coasting on those endurance rides, uh, interval sessions that he does to know he's ready for a race, those KJ deep efforts come up again, uh, training the efforts when you're not fresh, cycling nutrition, rate, race weight, stress, fasting, fat adaptation, confidence on race day, which I think is a huge topic that you want to hear about, visualization, nervous energy, and lastly, cordyceps mushrooms. So there's a lot in this episode. Cyrus, thanks so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and perspective. We greatly appreciate it. This is a good one. Everybody, make sure you hit up Cyrus at Cyrus Monk if you're on Instagram and tell him thank you. All right, guys, enjoy the episode. Hey, Brendan. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for uh, starting your morning off talking about cycling. Uh, No worries. Um, no, it's, uh, I'm uh, actually just at work at a school, but we've uh, um, just gone back into lockdown here, so there's no kids, so oh. it's pretty cruisy here. So, I, um, yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got plenty of time at the moment. Dude, congrats on a uh, solid ride the other weekend at the Nationals. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was good good to uh get out there it was annoying not to come away with the result from all the work in the breakaway but uh that's definitely how cycling goes sometimes yeah and when uh i think 35 guys finished it was uh yeah it looked like a brutal day i was i caught yeah, the end of it um through tis cycling yeah no it's always like that at um yeah australian nationals there's always very few finishes just because it's just a really hard circuit and um it's always just raced full gas from the start sounds awesome so what's so what's the rest so you guys are in lockdown so what does that mean for you guys for the rest of the year well it's only at this point it's only a five-day lockdown so because australia is going for the the zero cases we just had one outbreak from hotel quarantine so there's yeah, there's only, I think, 10 cases. Um, okay. And the idea is just to do a, a full lockdown for five days. And then um, that way it'll be back to zero and we can just open everything back up like it was before. Okay. Um, for me, the bigger thing is trying to get back to Europe um, because, yeah, ideally I'd love to get back over there. But there's uh obviously a lot of races getting cancelled at the moment um and yeah a lot of countries in and out of lockdown so ended up getting stuck there for four months last year with no racing at all and barely any training to do so um yeah it, i don't really want to get stuck in that situation again oh man where were you stuck in uh, i was in ireland so they had a really strict Gosh. lockdown i was only allowed two kilometers from the house for exercise so didn't get a whole lot of riding in then. Well, I was doing a lot of riding, but didn't get to see many roads. It was just the the 2K loop around my house. The uh, US crit riders would be fine with that. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, man, this is, I don't know what Alex had uh, mentioned to you about kind of what we've been doing with these, um, these kind of, I hate calling them interviews. Just, you know, there's so many, um, there's so much information out there and there's very few cyclists that make it towards your level. And I think as you go along, even though you're a young guy in the grand scheme of everything, you've learned and forgotten more than most cyclists will ever pick up on. And yeah, kind of sharing your process and your experiences. Um, it lends so many lessons to riders trying to get to where you're going, but also to like the amateur guys like myself that 
we just like to pick up on tidbits of who's doing what, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, yeah. Just as there's like a myriad of ways to coach somebody, there's a million ways to race and, and everybody has their own kind of journey towards it. So yeah, uh, appreciate you sh- shedding some light on what you've been doing. And yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of a conversation about if that works for you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, I'm cool with that. That's cool. Sweet. So Easiest question. I always say easiest, but sometimes people pause with it. Uh, who is Cyrus Monk? Uh, that's, geez, yeah, it is. <laughs> is it really? yeah. I'm going to start saying yeah. hardest question first. Who's Cyrus Monk? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm an Australian cyclist and, um, yeah, cyclist, musician, and scientist, I would say, would be three things. Tell me more about the musician and scientist. Uh, uh, the musician is just something I've been doing as a hobby. If anyone's following me on social media, uh, which I was doing a lot before, but I've only sort of started sharing it. But grew uh, grew up playing a lot of different instruments, and I just started making some stupid music videos out of those, um, and they've taken off arguably more than the cycling content has. <laughs> So that's been a good little pastime. And then I studied Bachelor of Science at Melbourne University and that was a major in physiology. So I still really like um, keeping up with all the latest research there and reading the journals. So I've got a big nerd side to me there. So I um, really enjoy the research and uh, yeah, applying that physiology to cycling. That's awesome. What are some uh, recent interesting papers or trends that you've seen popping up maybe that have affected your training? Uh, I think the, the supplement side of things is always, Mm. um, yeah, a pretty big one. Um, and unfortunately, like often I'm reading about things that I'm like, Oh, I can't try that because that's just not practical. Like ketones, for example, is a big one recently and they're uh yeah just extremely expensive yeah as um yeah for for most of us to try and get our hands on so that kind of thing and then uh also i'm really interested in heat training and heat adaptation um so a lot of the research i've been doing is on both passive and active heat acclimation so saunas and then Obviously, here in Australia, we get some pretty hot weather, so there's a lot of active heat acclimation without even thinking about it. So, uh, I uh, yeah, really like keeping up on all of that kind of stuff and seeing how I can use the the weather here to my advantage, and also get the most out of using saunas for uh, that kind of thing. So that's the the areas that I've been paying most attention to. The heat training is super interesting because even I remember people starting to talk about how heat training would have a possible physiological effect similar to training at altitude in terms of having some benefit, like the, not the same one, but like the absolute value of it. And what's, yeah, without having, you have to go into like deep into papers, are you doing heat before workout or just during, or is it the sauna after, or what's kind of like a bit of a bit of each so what's been the most promising recently is that sauna after it can have the same effect as heat during okay. so that's really good for for athletes because you're not ruining three or four sessions a week doing it in the heat and not being able to hit the power numbers so mm. obviously in that situation you get the the heat adaptation but you're not at training in the zones you'd like to be whereas this sort of means you can train in whichever zone you're prescribed and then after sit in a sauna and then you're getting sort of the best of both worlds. And then, yeah, as you said, like it's been likened to altitude training. There's still the studies are showing it doesn't quite have as high a magnitude effect, but uh, the, the short term effect that's been known for a while is that it increases the blood plasma. So obviously what carries the red blood cells around. Um, but now there's there's been some good studies showing that the longer term heat exposure, like three to four weeks, can actually boost your EPO as well. So obviously create some red blood cells that way. So that side of things is really good because like here in Australia, it's really difficult to train at altitude. We've got two ski resorts maybe that you'd get any benefit from, whereas mm-hmm. it's um yeah quite easy to to factor in some heat training either whenever you've you're in summer or through the use of saunas after training as well. 
Yeah, it's a, I grew up and started racing in the northern part of the U.S. So winter, super cold, hot for me was, I mean, you're on Celsius, but hot for me was 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So anyone who's listening from Australia, sorry, you'll have to convert that. Then I moved to Tennessee where hot is like 100. And I would go down and about three times in Georgia, they had nationals in um, like June or July. And when I was living up north, I stood no chance. I was like melting at the start line. And then, you know, years later, it was a completely different race. And, you know, I tried every, I tried to like acclimate over a couple of weeks of like, I'd wear a extra Jersey and like a vest and it would be 80. And it was just when you're living in it and training in it, it is just a whole different world. It's pretty crazy. So that's interesting. I'll have to look into some of that sauna information and, um, I could see people doing do Zwift at all. Like I could see people doing intervals inside and then hitting the sauna. So you're getting the maximum wattage and then. Yeah, no, I, I personally don't, I, I hate using the, the indoor trainer. I always get out whenever I can, but yeah. that's definitely like one that, cause ideally you do it as close to exercise as possible. So okay. I've been really lucky before where I've been living in in Melbourne in Australia has been just right around the corner from the sauna. So I can pretty much finish my ride at home and chuck a pair of shorts on and go there. And then where I was staying in Belgium for a few seasons, um, the house I was staying in had a sauna in it. So that was ideal as well. I'd just finish a ride and jump straight in. But yeah, there are a lot of people I remember maybe five years ago now, my coach was prescribing to some of us for our heat training to yeah put the the trainer in the bathroom and turn the the hot water on and uh that that was like the training for racing in asia where the humidity is really high was just to do that but i think i did one session of that and just said no i'm quitting cycling if i'm doing this every time this is (laughs) this is not fun so that's brutal that's brutal this is a much nicer alternative Oh man. All right. Well, everybody stay out of the bathroom and just go for the natural, find the hot environment. Um, so yeah. how long have you been racing and riding? How did you get into cycling? Uh, similar story to most, I guess. Like my dad was into it. He'd take me along to a few just local club races on the weekends that would have just been to watch back in the day. And I think I got my first road bike when I was nine. So like really early on, um, I was riding on the track. We're really lucky here. We've got a really good outdoor velodrome in um, Warrigal where I grew up, just in country Victoria. And uh, yeah, so that that sort of started me off. But it was really, cycling is not a major sport here in Australia. I think it's similar to America. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely second or third tier in terms of popularity amongst kids. So I was still playing Australian rules football and cricket up until I was 16, 17. And then I'd just do my one bike race on the weekend and maybe one or two training rides during the week. But um, yeah, I wasn't particularly good as a junior. I'd, I'd go to maybe one or two big junior races during the year and, and yeah, be out the back pretty early on. So um, it wasn't really until maybe, yeah, it was, it was basically when I left school, um, stopped playing um footy and cricket and um yeah started actually training more I was like oh wait this sport like if you actually train more you get better at it so I uh, (laughs) worked that one out and then yeah started um yeah really actually getting some results then that's awesome I think uh, most Americans that listen to this will be were super envious that cycling was even in your like realm of living when you were nine because so many of us, I'm 39. So I picked it up when I was 26. And that's like, if you're not for not the guys that are racing pro, but for like the average Joe is like, that's kind of young. Like a lot of people find it when they're 40 or something it kind of became like the new golf, yeah. you know, Lance and all that stuff. So uh, that's, yeah, that's awesome. What do you, what do you think has changed from, you know, you stop playing the footy and the cricket and you start getting into the training from when you first started training, you're probably getting tips from your dad or from like local guys. And now you're racing with Evo and you have, you, you know, your own education that you're interested in the science and the, how do I get better? What have you seen change, whether it be anything like training style, obviously hours and maybe structure and things like that, but even nutrition or anything that like instantly pops in your head, like, oh man, totally changed. Yeah. I think the biggest thing, 
when I was, yeah, obviously younger and going through school, I'd do like my, my bunch rides in the morning before school and then races on the weekend. So it was all intensity, like yeah. high, <laughs> high end stuff. And then even like when I was first riding outside of school, it was like just going full gas for Strava segments or like just going out and seeing what average speed I could hold, like just going everywhere hard. I think like the biggest thing, like volumes increased a lot, obviously, and then intensities just come down a heap for like the majority of the training. Um, I think that's one thing like people don't understand that haven't ridden with pros before, like the majority of our training is just talking pace. Like we don't go out and just try and destroy each other. Like there is, there will be a few rides a week where that does happen or like there will be times in the year where it's like, all right, this block is going to be a lot of like really uncomfortable stuff. But the majority of the training is just like zone one, zone two, and then your short effort blocks within that training. So that's been like the biggest thing for me. Yeah. Stepping up to the pro ranks, and then probably aside from that, the periodization, like when I just remember every single race was like, I need to be good for this race. And like here in Australia, maybe we've got like one or two sort of open big level races each month. Okay. So it's just like year round. And because our winter is obviously not too bad, like our, a lot of racing happens in the winter. So like we're racing in July, August here, and we're still racing in December, January, like crits every weekend so yeah i think now i've sort of had to accept all right there will be periods where i'm overtrained, periods where i'm under trained um and then yeah they'll actually i'll actually have to peak for the races that i want to target because at the level i'm racing at now like i i can't be at the top of my game for every single race or i'll just be what i think is at the top of my game i'm only running at 60 percent year round that is awesome for people to hear. And I think we, we've in some video, we'll post little like 10 minute videos and trying to help people see like, okay, if you have an A race, we'll call it for whatever reason, you might train through a B race. You might quote unquote race tired. What do you think of oh, the biggest thing that I find holds people back is it's the ego, right? You don't want to go up and Johnny, who you know you can beat, but you've been training all week and you're going to train through this. The guy's like, Ugh, but I got to rest a little bit. And so, like you're saying, he's not hitting 100% ever because he's got to rest a little bit before the B race. What do you think yeah. switched? Was it just like, hey, there was a realization like, I can't be great for everything. I got to pick and choose. Was it like the drive to get to the next level? Was it just you're okay yeah. with going in and getting smashed when you know you can I smash think, other um, people? Yeah, I think what was like good for me is I was, yeah, definitely I remember like back, yeah, when I would have been, yeah, 18, 19, I was thinking I have to win everything or like, yeah, this, as you said, like if that rider I knew I was better than if they bet me, I, I couldn't <laughs> handle it. But um, yeah, I think what helped is like doing, we have like, a lot of crits here in summer in Melbourne and I was um, doing those evening crits and then, but I knew I had to do my, like my, my coach had prescribed my training rides in the morning still. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always just ask, can I do four crits a week? Cause there's always a Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Saturday and Sunday crit. Um, and I'd always ask to do those. And he said, yeah, but you've got to actually do these specific efforts for your, um, for your, your big races coming up like they're non-negotiable so I said yeah that's fine I'll just do the crits after that but um yeah I think it meant I was always showing up to those crits like already tired and then mm-hmm. just had to accept right this isn't my best and then I think I was just seeing the results big time in the the actual the big races like once a month when they when it, they were 150 k's and in the last hour i'd look around and there was no one left and i'd just think all oh, right like these guys haven't been doing this they've been showing up to all of these crits fresh whereas um showing up to them like already with the load in the legs and then putting in that extra stuff on stuff on top and then i sort of realized all right like the winning crits here isn't going to get me anywhere but winning these big races is what i've got to target so i have to accept that yeah some of these races i won't be at my my a game dude that is awesome for somebody for athletes to hear from a guy like you because i think it is uh there's opportunity when it's like hey you could go ride 35 miles to the race and they're like but but everybody's driving it's like 
cool. But do you how do you want to be? It, it's not that you have to get every result, like you said. You got yeah. some of the big ones. Like that's what really yeah. takes somebody to the next level. Kind of flipping back when you're talking about the training and a lot of zone one, zone two stuff. Um, I think. Do you think it is often said like, "Hey, we're riding at a chattable pace." Chattable pace for you guys. It's every everything's obviously relative. But one thing I've always thought of is when newer cyclists are coming up, even their own zone two might not be chattable because they're just not aerobically fit. Um, do you guys, do you, would you say it's more zone like classic zones, like endurance riding? Like, are you often cruising at like truly like recovery pace or is it like you're still moving along and riding, like putting out the cage, yeah. just not, yeah. not going tempo and like belabored breath at all? Yeah, no, like the majority of time with that, yeah, I I am definitely one for I hate riding around like the the proper zone one stuff like right down because I sort of save that for the Rico days. So like you okay. or if I've got a hard effort day, then I'll do in between like the proper zone one to right. recover. But yeah, like the majority of time it's still on the pedals, but um it'll be yeah, so like on the pedals is like zone two. So like that'd be like yeah, for, for most of the guys I'm training with, we're sitting mid 200s, which, yeah, for the majority of people out there, they're like, oh, that's not hard, that hard, I can hold that. But I think the thing is, we'll sit at that for our five hour ride. Whereas for the majority of the, the amateurs out, that, uh, out there, like it's fine talking for 10 minutes, but then you've got the, the decoupling, like as, as they're sort of like losing the endurance um, aspect of it. Whereas, like, I think, because with like the, the guys I'm training with and myself, we've just been doing that kind of thing year after year, it just becomes so natural to ride around at that intensity. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's what benefits us for the longer races. Like, cause there's, there's pretty few races where you're actually just sitting in zone one for long periods. Like mm -hmm. the majority of time, it's still, especially in Europe, like it's always just in and out of corners. So like, there's never long, easy periods on flat, wide roads where you can actually just sit at that super low intensity. So it is up there, but yeah, like I, I'll still get annoyed if I go out for an hour spin with, um, yeah, with one of my mates who who is a weekend warrior and they're just half wheeling me the whole time and I'm sitting at 300 watts because I know that they can't actually hold that for a long period, but they just think that they have to do that to ride with, with me and my friends when the majority of time we wouldn't actually ride at that intensity that's funny yeah it's i think that's a good clarification because especially once like polarized training came out and it's like oh this is how all these pros are training and everyone's like oh well, i'm just doing this zone one and then people figured out what the actual zone one was but then everyone's like oh no it's all really easy or it's all really hard and i'm like like gotta clarify that because then everyone who's doing their endurance rides at least i, I deal with most of the people in the u.s it's like you'll tell them, Hey, go on a two hour endurance ride. And they come back and it's like, Hey dude, 40% was in zone one. Like you coach yeah. a ton. You need to actually pedal yeah. your bike if you want to get better at this. So yeah. do you have any, and obviously this is might be like race dependent, but I think a lot of athletes have some like favorite workouts or intervals sessions that they go do. And they're like, yeah, I'm ready. Like this feels good. Do you have anything that's just like it's always been in your wheelhouse? Like if you can go crank out something, you feel confident. Yeah, mine like for that, and it's I sort of hate it being like on the physiology side of things myself because it's not very objective. But mine is just like a local crit if I um <laughs> go there and and like feel good for that, and then that like I'll still look at the power for the the hour of that, and it's just like right if I'm sitting at like. 90% of my threshold for an hour and mm -hmm. in one of those crits then like I know that I'm on um in terms of like specific training sessions it's not really the maximal ones like obviously if I if I do a good test then I know I'm on like I'll I'll sometimes chuck those in um before like really close to a race like a one minute or something mm -hmm. but um yeah the more it's like if I'm doing some 20 minute sort of 90% kind of things, then if my heart rate's right down and I feel really comfortable, then I know I'm on. It's not mm -hmm. so much like doing a full gas effort and hitting those numbers. It's more like oh, I'm doing the efforts that usually are really uncomfortable and just cruising. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing those and I'm like, right, the engine's where it needs to be. And like, 
or the the physiological responses are there like my body can handle this it's not like stretching to to hit these numbers like it was before Mm -hmm. yeah i think it's interesting you know you made a comment in another podcast and it's slipping my uh still be in my mind where I heard it. It was, you were talking about your under 23 victory at nationals and how, when you went out to train, you're out with your buddy and you guys were ripping this, like, I forget how long, maybe like a 20 minute climb or something. And you said the watts we were doing that day in training were harder than at the race, but we just had to do them over and over again. And I didn't win the race because I had this crazy max wattage. It's what I did on like the, eighth ninth tenth or whatever like later in the yeah. race and i think yeah I, make some comment on just you know with a lot of internet stuff out there these days everyone is obsessed with their ftp number their one-off 20 minute power their watts per kg chart or something that's not really bike racing though like there's so much more that goes into it yeah and i thought just your comment of you ended it i wrote it down here you're like Luckily, it's not the numbers that win the race. It's how you use them. That played to my advantage today. And I was like, this dude's on it. Like, <laughs> it's pretty slick. What, yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Of no, that? that was um, that was one of my training partners, Jimmy Wheel. And so he's riding for EF now. Um, he had a and, great move at the end of that race last weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did he um, come from? Yeah, he, yeah, he's, um, he's, yeah, really, really similar trainer to me in that we like pushing the pace sort of everywhere we'll say on the pedals but like if it's an efforts day then it's like on for the efforts and then properly off to recover but yeah those sessions we were training together and then like yeah we're also training together before we both did the under 23 flanders and we're doing similar kind of things like it's really good when you can train with someone um that's at a similar level because you you can have that competitive aspect as you're doing your efforts as long as you're not going completely out of a zone but yeah, as like, yeah, as you were saying, the, the, the numbers, like, that's why I am so scared of doing the Zwift racing because I see the numbers people are putting out and I'm like, I straight up can't do that. And the races are all like between half an hour and an hour. And right. yeah, like physiologically, the, my FTP and that kind of thing is really just not that high. The thing that has got me in my wins is just still being able to do 95 percent of that ftp for an hour in the last hour of a race um and that's why i think i like racing in belgium because that's sort of how that plays out and you'll see like people look at power numbers like valon has been really good at releasing those for the end of the mm-hmm. classics race on like on the choir month for example and like maybe like Sagan's done 400 watts for the four minute climb up the climb and everyone goes, ah, oh, that's not crazy. Like I can do that. And it's like, yeah, sure. You can do that, but just do it at the the end of that day after 350 TSS already or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And um, I think that's where like the majority of people go wrong in their training um, as well is just only doing efforts when they're fresh and, finishing a few sessions um early when like when that's the time they should really be digging in to actually try and do it and like i think a lot of people because they'll do that one 20 minute test on the day that they feel amazing and just think right that's my ftp like that's what i should be able to ride everywhere at and the reality is like if you go into a race no one's actually like there's one person in that race that's actually hitting the numbers that they can possibly hit because they're just on an amazing day. Everyone else is a little bit off and it's just about managing that during the race to, um, to actually be there at the end still, rather than just, yeah, thinking, Oh no, I'm on an off day. I'm out of it already. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, you know, it's that one off day when you have that, you know, you might be a little bit fresher. You don't have the depth though. You don't have that third, fourth effort. Like it, actually when you're talking about getting ready for a race the one thing that had me there was um a pro race that i was able to do road race had five or six like five minute climbs and when i was like a week out and the fifth one my power was relatively close to the second and third one i was like okay like i'm at my best this is what i've got i've done what i can do time to go race and it wasn't that i was putting out like a lifetime pr it was just the repeatability was there um, and I think it's something I've talked to some of the guys from like WKO and like, how can 
this be tracked and how can you actually somehow put a metric on repeatability and it's just so hard from the math standpoint um, to have the program do that and to really like maybe break it down by system but to go at, after specific durations it gets really messy and it is it's it's tough because you you said it like athletes just go home they're like oh, i'm tired i'm done it's like oh no i would you should have just yeah. tried really freaking hard like you did all yeah. that work to do this one like yeah that's the one yeah um yeah i think with um yeah a few of the athletes i'm coaching personally now like our nationals is the same circuit every year and it's a six minute climb and then essentially 12 minutes well 11 minutes of rolling and downhill so like basically recovery but what people will do is just go out and do 16 six minute intervals and then they'll do that session once think yep that was amazing the next time just go oh, i can't do 16 of those again like i'm gonna be head cracked i can't like can't bring myself to do that whereas what i'll prescribe is just a completely random session like it might be an hour effort it might be three 20 minutes it might be a crit it might be like 30 30s whatever and then at the end three or four six minute intervals no matter what the session is at the intensity that what, whichever whatever intensity they can hold like what they would have been doing on the 16 minute is but essentially like once the fatigue's there it, it doesn't really matter how you've got it then it's just a matter of all right what can the muscles do once that fatigue's already there and that's mm -hmm. what you'll find in like races and you notice it with certain sprinters like i always just notice it with christoph like he if if it's in a boring sprint stage where everyone's fresh like you'll you'll come eighth or ninth every single time if you look on the results sheet he's there whereas um yeah if it's the end of a classic where everyone's at that thing he's still sprinting at that same power that he was before whereas everyone else has lost 30 percent, and that's the races that he wins of those it would be really interesting to see like you know if there was a way to start compiling this data of fatigue resistance of like, you know, having different tiers, like you guys are probably definitely over 3000 KJ, you know, maybe 4,000 it's things are changing now here in the U S with like gravel racing becoming really popular. It's like these 150 mile, uh, seven to dirty Kansas, 10 hours, uh, Colin Strickland just beat 10 hours, but it's like, it, it, it's really, you're making me think of, um, you know, it's not what the event is. It's like, what is the event? We always hear like event specific training. We should really be saying event specific training at the end when you're tired. Like that's yeah. what it is. That's, yeah. that's really interesting. What's, um, so what do you think is maybe on a nutritional side? You seem really into the signs, obviously, has nutrition changed for you at all over the past years? And has, you know, now being with Evo, has having more connections within the industry changed anything? Or is it just really like whatever information you can find is the best stuff out there? Um, where yeah. are you coming at with that? I think um, I've definitely nutrition's been like, it, my nutrition personally has been influenced by just what type of rider I've been trying to be. So I think like, when I was yeah first starting out and really getting serious when I was at the start of under 23s it just I just wasn't paying any attention to it at all just like was naturally a skinny kid growing up just thought mm -hmm. yep this is fine and then had like a, a winter here like I was studying pretty flat out so I had exams what wasn't riding that much for a month and then jumped on the scales and I was like seven kilos heavier than i thought i was going to be i was like oh holy shit like this thing matters and like i have to actually pay attention to this um so then like yeah managed to just actually watch watch what i eat it was like all right instead of eating rubbish i'll just eat good food and then it was pretty simple from then to get back down to like a, a standard weight again and then i think um obviously like i was climbing okay at the time but i was like right i really want to be like climbing properly good like my threshold's getting up there now so I, I um yeah just did the the classic thing and thought right I'm just gonna see how skinny I can get and um it went like 
a lot of people just say, oh, you lose all your power. Well, like for three months, I was like flying, had the same power, was just as light. And then just, I think, staying down like that low, I was only maybe six or 7% body fat. Like, so there's still a bit there compared to what you see some riders at, but I clearly just couldn't handle it because I just got super fatigued. I was sleeping like 12 hours a day and then, um, yeah, just had super low testosterone, which is another thing like a lot of cyclists seem to get if they push that too hard. Um, so then I went, all right, well, I'm useless now because I, um, I can't do the power at all. And then, yeah, I after that went, all right, I've got to put on more weight. And then so I was at a point where I was heavier and didn't have the power. So I was like, all right, now I've completely completely gone like the wrong way so basically just started again after that and was like right I'm not gonna be that genuine um climber which like I think that's just a lot of that's just a genetic kind of thing and as to whether you can stay at that kind of kind of body fat for uh longer periods um sustainably which I sort of found out the hard way that I can't so Mm -hmm. then I was since then and at that time as well I was doing a lot of fasting to um get down there and a lot of fasted rides so a lot of it was lower intensity or sweet spot stuff whereas um since then i've sort of realized right i'm gonna have to be that punchy kind of rider because i won't be able to go with pure climbers on the long climbs um so and then part of that change has been like adapting my diet to like to fuel for those sessions where i'm really targeting the high-end stuff um and that's where i've noticed big differences in the last sort of two years um getting the most out of those sessions fueling is like is paramount you just cannot do those higher intensity sessions or those big kilojoule sessions if you don't have the fuel there so i still will use um the fasted rides on recovery days or occasionally if i've just got a, a cruisy ride um and a lot of that is more just for like the other effects, like the um, effects off outside of weight, um, just the benefits to fasting. But um, yeah, the majority of rides now, I just make sure I really feel well for those higher intensity ones. And I've been getting the results that way. Would you do, if you had a hard, say you have a recovery ride, you're thinking about fasting on Monday and you had, would you do that if you had a hard session on Tuesday? Do you feel like you can turn turn it around fast enough like get your glycogen stores filled up Um, yeah definitely i think um yeah i definitely that would be the standard one like monday and friday usually the easy days like obviously it changes from week to week but Mm -hmm. i'd make those the faster and they won't like i won't fast the whole day just go right in the morning have a good lunch and then the main thing i find is just um yeah getting the the carbs in with the right foods as much as I can like I was definitely when I was doing a lot more fasted stuff it was because they have like a I've definitely got a sweet tooth so like I I like my um my cakes my pastries and that kind of stuff and I was doing like all right if I can fast for 18 hours today then I can um then I can have like a cake after dinner whereas like now I've just realized obviously like it it wouldn't have been that hard to work out before trying it but i've realized now that you you just feel a heap better if you actually just have like a a bowl of rice and your like and your stir fry as well or curry as well like as that and then after if i have something like that and i don't feel like i need the cake after whereas before i'd go all right i'm just gonna have my steamed broccoli and tuna and then oh that means i can have a cake after and then you end up like yeah under fueled you you like still don't feel satisfied so i think um yeah definitely just at the end that's something i just tell all of my athletes too is just like real food as much as you can it's pretty pretty simple it's easy to it's amazing how many people get stuck doing the the wrong thing and like um yeah try try other ways but yeah real food makes you feel good and then you'll be training better for that when you say the wrong thing what would you refer to as that what do you see some like missteps that athletes take uh i think just like it's the the classic disordered eating that you see like the majority of um 
professional cyclists have characteristics of it and then some will just act on those and then some sort of know to ignore those which is just if I don't if like if I skip breakfast it means I can eat more later or Mm. if they end up having something like if they are someone offers them a biscuit or a cake they're like oh now i have to chuck an extra hour onto my ride tomorrow to to burn off those calories and that's like the the classic thing but um from what i've found personally like acting on all of those i haven't seen any better results with my weight than if i was just eating normal food anyway and um yeah that acting that way you're constantly just thinking about food constantly thinking about diet am i doing this right am i doing this wrong and that's just um stress and um just thinking time that could be put into actually getting your training right which is going to be much more beneficial to your cycling as a whole definitely are you a fan of like carb loading before a big race like the road nationals or something yeah i um i've done a fair bit of research into that for the kind of events we're doing and um because that's sort of one of the benefits of the the faster rides that I have done and also the kind of training that sitting at zone two for long periods I do I have done sort of testing and also from just personal experience know that I'm quite well fat adapted so in something like that um national road champs or any longer races I'm confident that I can mostly utilize fat so I don't have to worry too much about the um the carbohydrate loading like as long as i'm not yeah as long as those glycogen stores are are relatively full which i'm always confident that i can just do through a normal sort of diet in a few days leading up like i I don't go too crazy on it i definitely have before we have a race here called the melbourne to warrnambool which is 270k um so that's always a seven hour day and i um so that's okay um yeah seven hour day and um yeah i i went a bit like crazy a few years with that like in the two days prior just shoveling food in and i always just feel find i feel more lethargic if i'm like focusing on eating carbs when i'm not hungry so like now i think i've definitely just learned to let like my the listen to my body more and like if i feel hungry make sure that's carbs rather than fats or proteins in the Mm -hmm. the days leading up to an event but yeah if i'm not hungry then i don't need it is my usual thoughts cool yeah so the benefits i find most from fasting would probably be i've done a lot of research into the sort of anti-cancer side of things um because obviously we're constantly as athletes just pumping sugar into our body and um, have quite a high metabolism because we're just turning over all of this fuel day in day out so because the body's sort of always working to process that really quickly it's nice to just slow things down and um, slow down that cellular metabolism which is obviously then going to lead to um, yeah a chance for the the body to actually check over all of the cells which um yeah, there is a, a lot of research into it and it's obviously still pretty young at this point because they're, they're, they're pretty hard studies to do because it obviously takes so long to work out whether people are developing cancer and the, these intermittent fasting diets haven't been around for that long. So that's, that's part of the reason I do the fasting and then another is to also just um, help make me more fat adapted. So when... Um, yeah, the way I can sort of tell that is I can do a fasted ride for four or five hours and still be putting out a decent power in zone two at the end. Obviously, I can't go really into zone three, four or five. Like once I get above that, then you're relying too much on carbs and um, there's only obviously a finite source of those. Whereas I find I can tick along at that um, zone two intensity for the majority of a ride and still get through without needing to refuel at all because I've got those fat stores there to use and available and um yeah the body can preference those and then i've also done some lab testing as well with the the mask on and everything and looked at the respiratory exchange ratio at different intensities and basically yeah the the testers there sort of let me know that yeah you're uh, quite well fat adapted up to a significant proportion of my own threshold so 
it's good for longer races. I sort of know that I don't have to worry too much about fueling if it's a one day race. It's more so if it's back to back races, then during stages you have to be getting in the carbs, not just after, because otherwise it's putting a bit too much pressure on the gut. But yeah, it's definitely something I've found beneficial um, trying to help myself adapt that way because it's just um, obviously you still have to watch the carbohydrate intake, but I haven't had too many problems with ever going hunger fight or bonking or really um, going, yeah, going much worse if I don't get those carbs in during a race. Um, would you have any, uh, when mindset has come up in a lot of these conversations more so than I thought, uh, they would, do you do any like training for, or just even like thought process about like how to get your mind ready before a big event. So you're doing things like talking about less stress is better. You're going to race better when you're not stressed out. Um, some people were talking about, they use apps like headspace to actually calm down is mindset, anything I'm not trying to say it's anything come to mind when I talk about minds. I need to think about a different way. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, I have definitely like had a bit of, um, yeah, had to put some thought into that more recently than, yeah, I think racing here sort of coming in, especially when I was first starting out, there was no pressure. No one knew who, who I was at the races. So it's quite easy to, to go out and just think, all right, I'm going to try and do it the best I can. Um, mm. Whereas, yeah, now there was a period there when I'd first been going over to Europe and getting some results there and then coming back, then you become the marked rider. And I was struggling a bit with that pressure for a while. And then um, one thing that helped me there is just like having a team around me that, um, basically I uh, ended up becoming more focused on just helping the team get results here because personally I was more focused on the races in Europe than the results here. So it wasn't a big deal for me here. And then um, more recently, yeah, going to the races in Europe, my confidence is just a big thing that I've been trying to focus on. So in those races, you just have to sort of believe that you belong at the front of the peloton or you won't be there. You'll always just let someone else in front. And then if you're racing from the back in races in Belgium and France, then you'll, you'll have no chance to compete. So I think for me, yeah, just thinking about past rides that have gone really well um, in similar races to whichever the one coming up and using that sort of imagery to, to picture how the race plan out positively for me so yeah i'd like to sort of draw on past experiences because i find it helps me imagine how i'm going to win that race and that's something mm -hmm. i talk to anyone that i'm sort of mentoring coming forward is every race that you go into obviously there's races that we all start where you know you can't win like if i'm starting one fun two at the, the pro race that's just been going on, I know I'm not going to win that race. But if it's a race where you hope to win, you have to have an image in your head of how am I going to win this race? So the the last national champs, for example, I was thinking, right, there's a few climbers that I know I can probably go with on the last few laps. I'm going to, like in my head, I'm thinking, right, I'm going to be following these climbers up the last climb. It's going to really hurt. And then I'm going to be able to beat them in a sprint. Like, and had those sort of images in my head. And then what, like, I personally will use, and it's sort of a technique, um, our, our team coach with Evo Pro, our, um, he, our sort of mental health coach, he just said, if you can find, highlights or footage of previous races you've done well and just watch it the night before and it's obviously super narcissistic so just watch yourself the um <laughs> the day before a race but um yeah I did find that just helped a heap because you you just immediately that image is in your head of right oh yeah I can do that like I've I've done this before against this this opposition before so then that's immediately there on the start line the next day I belong here I I should be able to do this again that is phenomenal advice. I love the visualization. I've always thought that, you know, if you can't convince yourself before the race starts that you have a chance to win, you don't have a chance to win because when things get crazy and it's going ham, <laughs> if you've already told yourself that those guys are faster and they're going to drop you, you just drop yourself. Like it's, it's yeah. game over. 
Um, get going back, getting being in the front, and this is you know definitely a perspective of you. If you go and race with some world tour guys, I'm sure they're like, dude, get out of here. Sometimes like they don't know who you are. Or even for amateurs, when it's like in the U.S., we have like Cat One Two is like the elite race, but then there's Cat Threes that get to race with them. And a lot of times, like, yo, let's just gas this to get rid of these guys, and then we'll all race. What do you think? How was your mindset? If you any races or like when you're kind of you know obviously not literally throwing elbows, but when you're trying to get in there and be in position because you have a job to do, was it just like telling yourself like you said before, I belong here, I belong here, I and eventually the more people see you, then they're kind of like, okay, this dude's here, we're gonna like you're here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The that's it's definitely a big part of it is just not being there to make friends. Like obviously, I'm definitely a big one for for trying to keep it safe. Like I don't the yeah i'm all all fine for like a bit of contact on the bike but i, mm -hmm. I hate when you get people squabbling that much that they yeah they're headbutting each other in the bunch because it just makes it unsafe for everyone else but there just has to be that all right uh, this i know this person's gonna be annoyed at me for it but i'm taking this wheel and mm -hmm. like that kind of thing and the reality is like i know personally like myself if i'm racing against like in a in a club race, for example, where someone I've never seen before comes up and tries to take wheel, I think, all right, I'm really annoyed at this guy, but he just wants to do the same thing as me, which is be at the front of this race and follow the next attack. So like there's never it's never gonna be a, a personal fight if if you're uh, trying to be up there. That's just part of the sport. And the way I sort of think about it is just think back to like contact sports I've played before. Like if you think even like even um american football like if you're an offensive guard like you have to think that you you belong like it's a pretty simple one like he's staying there he's not letting anyone pass to get mm -hmm. to the quarterback so like the yeah the cycling i think even though there isn't the contact there a lot of it's sort of implied like you're just like all right I'm, am i gonna let this guy in or not you just have to think no like this is that's part of the the job. That's part of the race is actually holding that position. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people don't realize when they sort of get to the higher level and the big bunches is that, um, yeah, part of that job there is, yeah, you need to actually to be able to hold your position and believe that you should stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, I've, it's, I, there hasn't been as many because of COVID, obviously, uh, no group rides. I love how you guys call them bunch rides, but that's one thing that I've yeah. always tried to tell, like when you're mentioning like a local race, you know, I might ride up to something, just kind of like push them over a little bit. And I'm like, Hey dude, don't let me do that. Like that, that was, yeah. your, that was your spot. Like, you know, yeah. even though I don't know you and you might know me, it's hold your ground and I'll respect you more for doing that. And then I'm like, Oh, this dude's here to race. Okay, cool. I think it's good because yeah. there's so much of this mental side to the sport that it's not just Watts and you know, people come off of the trainer and they go to race and then they're just like, what the hell happened? And I had a friend who went to a crit one time. <laughs> we were talking about the race. He's like, yeah, I, you know, I got this bike and I'm gonna start training and he goes and it started and he, I, he literally had no idea what was going to happen. He's like, dude, everyone like took off and you forget yeah. how much people don't know and how much like it just so much to learn from bike racing. And that's what from the beginning, I was like, dude, you've forgotten more than a lot of people will ever learn. Um, yeah. Got a few more questions for you. If you got a couple minutes, don't want to take up too much yep. of your time. Um, do you have anything that on race day is big in your race routine that you're not necessarily superstitious with, just uh, helps you like, you're like, this is a good part of my groove, maybe breakfast or pre-ride or something like that? Yeah, I'm not really... Yeah, me personally, I don't have anything like that just because, and I always sort of, I'll I sort of take the mickey out of people that do do that kind of thing just because everywhere you are, there's so many things that could be out of your control and you might not be able to do that. So there's like certain mm -hmm. people that have to put their warm up cream on at a certain time before, but like I just find, yeah, here, like, in Australia, it might be be easy to to like have something in your kit bag, like a some kind of tea or whatever, like 
that you're sipping on before the the race whereas like if i'm racing in ireland one week or like serbia the next week or something then like it's it's going to be way harder to have each thing ready to go and i don't sort of like to i try to avoid as many of those necessary things as possible so that it doesn't um yeah so that i don't end up thinking oh, i couldn't do that this week therefore uh, it's going to um mess with me for the race so yeah there's not so much for that i think for me it's more just try and just not think about the race for as long as possible um because a lot of people just end up spending like one or two hours of that nervous energy just in the bus before the the race start just thinking about the race so much Mm -hmm. it's almost just removing the things that will psych you out as opposed to adding things to yeah yeah create more responsibility that's good i like that um do you have a favorite failure that maybe ended up catapulting you towards success where at the time you're like man this sucks but it actually ended up being a good thing um maybe training experiences races um yeah um yeah it's a good question i haven't thought about that one um i think yeah i think probably uh yeah with the the completely overdoing the diet thing probably um was a good one to sort of realize all right the training is more important than than the fasting for every ride to to cut down on calories like that that was a big one um and then just yeah each each race just each mistake like that sort of cost me a win is gain me a win down the path like mm-hmm. yeah there's i think especially racing now since i think i did my first race when i was 10 like that i sort of put to my advantage because it's so many situations i've been in with like yeah one on one one on like in a group of seven in a group of 20 in a group of 100 like coming into the the finish of races and like can guarantee now i'd say it would have I've probably done about a thousand races and I would have made at least, yeah, 900 mistakes. Like uh, I would have made that. I I think now I've made the majority of mistakes. It's just a matter of not making them again, like not mm-hmm. doubling up on those. And um, I think that's the, the key to actually to winning the races is like some days you're simply not good enough, but if you can win, that's, something for me especially not having the the crazy numbers that i see some guys naturally have like for me if i can be the 10th best rider in a group of 15 at the end and win then that's that means a lot more than if i'm the best rider and win um so like the more races i can win where i'm not actually the strongest rider there um the the better i'll the further i'll end up getting as a cyclist And that's also too, I think when you were talking about when you went back and you were racing more of the local scene and it was like, when you became the marked man, you're almost racing to not lose as opposed to racing to win. Everyone you're, you're the guy now, like, Oh, Cyrus is here. We're going to all gang up on this dude. It's just like, Oh man. Okay. This is, and when you can then spread it out and help other people win, it definitely takes the pressure off. And, um, yeah. What do you have as, um, so if you were teaching a basic class to new cyclists getting into road racing and you had like your methodology, your big points, what's maybe one or two things that you're like, these are, if you take anything away from this, what are a couple things that you need to remember? I think the, yes, two, two biggest ones. One is it has to be enjoyable. Like it's mm. such a hard sport, um, mentally and physically, that if you're not having fun racing and you're not having fun training, like it has to be both. You have to find enjoyment out of racing when you don't win, especially because the majority of races you don't win. So if you're if you're hating every race you lose, then you're not going to keep racing. Mm. And then same goes with training. Like there will be sessions that are either too hard or too cold or too wet like there's the odd one that you won't enjoy but if you're not yeah if you need to be able to enjoy the majority of the sessions like i'm super lucky that i i do enjoy just riding my bike um 
like no matter what almost like even if it's raining I'll I'll be the one out there sort of laughing and um <laughs> like joker style in in the rain because um I'm still out there enjoying myself but yeah in, you have to enjoy it and then the the second one which I tell everyone is keep the easy days super easy and the hard days super hard like so many people just get sucked into just like riding everywhere kind of solid um but yeah that's like the biggest one is if if you're um not not doing the hard days hard you're not doing the damage to the muscle um Mm -hmm. in the first place and if you're not doing the easy days easy enough then you can't repair that damage so yes it's um that's that's definitely the biggest one for me if you can do those two things then it's it's a pretty simple sport well said i think it's like trying to have people get the concept of really pushing the envelope to elicit this response like you need to dose yourself with a stimulus that's going to make your body be like oh damn i need to get stronger as opposed to yep. just like working out like you're not going to spin yeah. class that's not going to make you a better yeah. bike racer <laughs> we're not just yeah i love burning kjs but it can't be just that um yep. what are some ways that people so your coach how can people get in touch with you how what's the best way for them to follow you online um yeah so basically instagram um yeah check dms then regularly so yeah you can easily contact me on that so that's just cyrus monk or okay. one word um cool. twitter is cyrus underscore monk okay. um or and then yeah i've also got my own um website which i've been posting a few um yeah just a bit of the recent literature like science literature just in a format for anyone to understand um and that's called cyclist or scientist dot com okay so so yeah i've got that up there and um that's just a really good starting point for for people that sort of uh worried about falling into traps of things they've heard that sort of just busts a few myths on there with the actual evidence from the scientific literature rather than just what the the supplement that's been put out what they claim it's actually showing sort of the the evidence behind it um, okay yeah so people can get into to contact with me there um and yeah happy to to answer any questions that people have that's awesome and i actually have one more question when you just said supplement i meant to ask you did you do you take any supplements are you your currently research? currently no none at all like a big thing for me um and what i i tell people is like just um if it's if it's going to cost you that much money and you well, if it's going to cost you a lot of money, you'd want to be sure it works. Um, and then the majority of time, like the, the more research I do, the more it shows, look, we haven't, we can't actually prove that this works. Um, with just about any supplement um, out there, there currently. And then the, the thing for me is just trying to get it from food as much as possible. Like mm-hmm. I do, I really enjoy eating. So like if, if I'm going <laughs> to finish a ride and need, need my protein, I'd much rather have, an omelet um than a shake like I'd, I'd rather just try and like eat eat like get everything for food i'm lucky that while i'm yeah in the win in the one place and can control my food like i've been the last few months it's been pretty easy i think when i am on the road traveling is mm-hmm. when i'd look more to supplements because it can be harder to manage if you're always eating hotel buffet food what kind of nutrients you're getting yourself that yeah currently i'll just try and get everything i can from food would you bring stuff with you or would you land and be like yo we got to go to the grocery store and you're trying to get like bar like trying to eat as most real food as possible without going to the hotel style or how would you manage that when you're traveling around um yeah basically i try and go to the the grocery store um mm-hmm. if i yeah if i'm in a place where like it often it's just completely inconsistent like you can we can be on a, a tour in france and one hotel the, the food's great you're getting all your vegetables meats and carbs um and then the next hotel you go to is just rice and chicken and nothing else but um yeah so for that sometimes it's just a late night grocery run um mm-hmm. with with a few other team members to to try and pick up what you need but yeah and then depending on i will take like if i'm on an altitude camp iron supplements that's like definitely one that the research supports um 
use of that if you are going to be generating new red blood cells. Um, but yeah, the majority of the time, like I, um, for me, that's a, another thing is with the travel, it can be hard to get the same supplement wherever you go. So mm-hmm. times that I have been using supplements, I've gone to a different country and gone, oh shit, I can't get the same thing. I don't know what this supplement is. I can't be sure of this thing, whether it's going to be legal or not here or if it's got some other thing in it I don't know about. So for me personally, like it's a lot easier just to try and get everything I can from food. Have you ever looked into cordyceps mushrooms before? I have, yeah. Uh, so that's one that I'm about to sort of do do a little review on and um, study on, on on the website. But yeah, I'm I've, uh, to that. yeah, I've um, no, I've heard, that's one that like um, one of the athletes I coach in Ireland like said uh, showed showed me the the thing, and I was like, geez, those are some pretty big claims. The mm. um, what what it had on the side of the container, and then. Um, actually did a bit of a, a quick scan online and went, I oh, just, these look like they actually could be the real deal. So that's definitely one um, that, yeah, the, the thing is like, it, it looks on the website, like I'm skeptical, but I'm always hopeful that these things do work because uh, yeah, for me personally, if you can find something that, that, that uh, does have a significant benefit, then I'm hoping it works as well so that I can uh, use it myself. So I don't know if it's over there. Was it Optogen from um, Optogen HP? Because that's where I first. Uh, met. Okay, I'm not. I'm not even sure what brand it was. No, I can't even so remember it's now. it's super interesting. So there's a company here called First Endurance, and this is where I first heard about this. And uh, the Hincapi team was sponsored by them, and so we started looking into this. And they don't post the research online anymore. I have to look if I have the studies, but we started digging in and possibly like how do we source some of this and get our own and there's a few different types of cordyceps mushroom the interesting thing was all the stuff they were putting into the capsules their dosage was less than what their study actually said you needed to take and we're like we're like that doesn't make sense why would they do that well number one was cost number two was you'd have to take i think we estimated like 28 capsules a day so yeah. we st- they had beta alanine in it, in it, which I'm a big fan of, but the cordyceps yeah. I source from another place that's just a mushroom farm. And um, it's been, I'm, I'm 100% in on it. Um, but yeah, yeah I'll, be, I'll, I'll definitely be checking out the website. Um, yeah. Dude, this was awesome. Thank you so much. This will cool. be extremely beneficial to so many people. Uh, hopefully post it next week and I'll tag you in all the social stuff. And Sweet. Um, for everybody out cool. there, give Cyrus a what's up. Give him a follow on Instagram and Twitter. Check out the website. And dude, best of luck, man. I'll be rooting for you awesome. wherever you go. And, uh, Sweet. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks for being here. And hopefully I, I did a tour of Southland last year. And uh, yeah. you're... I realized different country, not Australia, but um, yeah. that part of the world was just incredible. And I hope to be yeah. back. And That's if you're down there, nice. hopefully cross paths yeah. on a easy zone two ride. And uh, yeah. Yeah, best cool. of luck with best of luck with everything, Cyrus. Sweet. Cheers. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, man. Catch See up. ya. See ya.